and we were looking broadly at what role does um, All right, uh, up with now, now, now we've got feedback. And then yeah. now this. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh. April 18th. It's on there. Test. Test. Okay. There we go. I think, okay. I think they can hear they can. you. Okay, great. Excellent. Right. Okay, you didn't miss much online. I was just talking about my background as a teacher, grad student. Um, for the last ten years, I've been at the I School at the University of Washington, um, and I've co-founded and co-directed the Digital Youth Lab. And we basically are a group of researchers, um, graduate students, undergraduate students, um, and faculty. And we're studying the role of new and emerging technologies in young people's development, um, their well-being, their learning, all of these things. We come at it from lots of different disciplines, but mostly HCI and education and the learning sciences. Um, and I also included my role as a parent. Um, that's a really, um, obviously, a big role in my life, uh, but I don't usually talk about it so much um, when I'm in a professional context. But that's different with this book because um, in my book, Technology's Child, I'm looking at the full arc of child development, and um, that includes young children. And so in most of my research, I have focused on adolescents, but I'm looking at little kids, middle childhood, adolescence and emerging adulthood. Um, and so my son Oliver figures pretty um, centrally in those early chapters. Um, okay, so as a professor, generally what I do is I study what young people are doing with technology. And mostly that has been in the context of um, teens and social media, but more and more I've been looking at younger kids um, Oh, okay, let me move that up so it's out of your way. Okay, yeah. Um, and then, um, as many of us in an iSchool do, I take that empirical understanding and I use it to try and um, design better technology experiences that are supportive of young people's learning and development. So that's what I do as a professor. Um, but, you know, as a parent, what I'm trying to also figure out here is how many episodes of Paw Patrol am I allowed to uh, let Oliver watch uh, before it's just too many? Um, and so that's kind of what brings me to um, writing this book was, you know, before I had a child, people would ask me typically outside of academia, okay, so what is it? Is technology good or is it bad for kids? What's the verdict? That's often what I would um, get. And as a dutiful researcher, I would say, well, it's very complicated. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. Um, and then I became a parent and I realized, oh gosh, that was not helpful at all. You know, as a parent, you really want to know, well, what do I do? How many episodes is good? What, what is bad? You know, you want some concrete answers. And so that's really why I wrote this book was to try and corral all of that complicated research that we have and 
you know, bring to bear some sort of concrete framework so that we can think about making good decisions when it comes to kids and technology and hopefully, you know, point a direction forward in terms of researchers and designers of where we want to go with um, kids technology. So that's why I wrote the book. So in my talk, um, I'm going to make sure that we um, leave a little bit of time, at least for questions, but I have it in three parts. Um, the first part, I'm going to um, introduce a framework, and that's really the framework that binds together this book. So I'm looking at a wide age range, and it's, you know, what do little toddlers have to do with college age kids? Um, I'm going to try and bring that all together in a framework that will help us as researchers, parents, anyone with a kid in their life, answer the question, when does technology support development and when does it not? I'm gonna talk about some factors that might um, affect um, this framework and the things that we need to keep in mind. Um, so what influences the quality of a digital experience? And then a call to action. Um, how can we support the good kind and reduce the bad kind? So that's what I'm gonna focus on. Um, if you feel like I'm talking a lot in this first part, don't worry, this, the second two parts are shorter. So I'm really going to focus in on this first part, um, the framework. So, um, but I want to first start, up and but because this is a book about child development, so I thought it would probably be good to talk a little bit about how I view development and where I'm coming from here. Um, so I was trained by um, a developmental psychologist, but one who really didn't spend much time in an actual lab. And so Howard was very interested in um, how kids come to understand who they are in a particular community. And so I really draw on this, uh, an understanding of development as not just what's going on inside of a child's brain, although of course that's extremely important, but how that then manifests in particular cultural communities and really viewing development as a process of changing how you participate in your cultural communities. So a two-year-old, the way they interact and engage with the environment around them is going to be different, not just because of what's going on in their head, but how that then interacts with the communities around them. So that, I just want to lay that um, background because I am gonna be talking about what goes on in a child's head, but only insofar as it, it influences their interactions with their environments. Okay, so the first part is introducing a framework. When does technology support development and when does it not? So basically this is kind of the thesis of the book. I'm making the argument based on the research that I've done, the research that's out there um, widely looking at different ages and stages of development that when it comes down to it, Self-directed, community-supported digital experiences are best for children's development. And so what does that mean? I'm going to use as an example to dig into this, um, children's digital play. And I'm gonna start with Oliver, because I told you Oliver is an important part of this early parts of the book. So in this little video that I did of him, he's playing this, um, playing with Peppa's paint box. Peppa Pig. Um, if you're familiar with Peppa Pig, um, he loves Peppa. And um, with this, he can draw um, a painting. So here he's choosing the color that he wants. He's chosen blue. He wants to use just a big blob of paint so that he could have a blue background. And then from there, he can choose what um, paintbrush he wants to use. And you can see he's just kind of doing whatever he wants, very free form. Um, looking at different things that he can do. Here, there's lots of different little stamps that are aligned with the story of um, Peppa Pig. Um, here, the, this one is little flowers, so really like those. Skip ahead, he's added a bunch of things, and then Peppa and her friend admire the, the painting that Oliver drew. Now, it's probably not going to end up on the loop, but um, <laughs> You know, it's it's his, and he kind of did it on his own. It was very open-ended, free form. And so what I'm arguing is this kind of experience where Oliver here is really kind of in control of how he's interacting with this particular app. Um, this is a good example of a self-directed uh, technology experience. And so particular qualities of self-directed 
experience. One, it's very open-ended. So with Peppa's um, paint box, Peppa Pig's paint box, um, this is a totally open-ended. He opens the app and it's a blank canvas. He could switch over if he wanted to, to a um, um, like different coloring pages that he could just color in. But the default is that it's a blank canvas and then he can choose what he wants um, like what colors he wants to use, what um, implement, whether it's a big can of paint or a particular drawing implement. It's totally self-paced. That's quite different from a lot of um, technologies that are aimed at kids and even adults. Um, but, you know, he really directs how much he wants to put on that canvas. He directs when he's done and he wants to move on. You know, this particular, I sped it up, that, um, that video, but that particular session lasted him about 10 minutes, which is kind of about how long he plays when he's not on a screen. And it was after that, he was like, okay, I'm done. Um, you know, and so very self-paced. And there are a lot of um, what I talk about in the book, loose parts in that. So um, I'm gonna talk, a, spend a little bit of time um, describing what I mean by loose parts, but um, insofar as they're available in digital form, something like Peppa's paint box is a good example of loose parts. But I'm gonna back up for a sec and explain what I mean by loose parts and how important they are in supporting young people's play. So if you're anything like me, um, during the pandemic, there were a lot more cardboard boxes in your apartment or your house. And um, this was you know, kind of the height of the pandemic. Um, we were living in Berlin at the time, and this is Oliver and his stepsister, Philippa. And um, they engaged in a lot of loose parts play because we had a lot of cardboard boxes um, that accumulated in our apartment. And the idea of loose parts comes from uh, Simon Nicholson, who is a, a sculpture, art, um, sculpture professor, that's right. And I first encountered this idea in Alexandra Lang's excellent book, The Design of Childhood, um, that came out a few years ago. Um, and basically the idea is as simple as the name. You know, if you think about just any sort of loose parts that you have around your environment, it could be a cardboard box, it could be paper clips outside, it could be sand, pebbles, anything where kids can use the items around their, in their environment and use them in the service of their self-directed play, open-ended um, imaginative play. And so the idea is that the more loose parts kids have in their environment, um, the more they can actually engage in the kind of play that is really supportive of development, supportive of um, them developing self-regulation skills, even you know, um, peer interactions and moral sensibilities and things like that, because they're in charge. They use these loose parts for their play rather than having some external um, stimulus guide them in their play. So the concept of loose parts is one that I use throughout the book to think about um, you know, when is a digital experience in a child's control and when is it not? Um, and so I think about, are there loose parts in digital play? And so as we saw with Peppa's paint box, yeah, there actually can be loose parts in, in so far as there's, um, you can choose the, um, the kind of implement that you're using, you can choose the colors, you can choose whether it's a straight line or a dash line. So there is quite a lot of choice there and it is quite open-ended. Um, however, there are, generally speaking, loose parts are a little bit harder to come by in digital format compared to the analog world. And so here are two um, pictures of Oliver playing in analog um, land and in digital format. And you can just see, even though these are still pictures, you know, his interactions are different. Um, on the left-hand side, he's playing with um, um, Lego blocks, and there's just a lot that he can do, and a lot of, he's, he's really focused um, on his attention, is very much focused where he wants it to go. He's in control of his attention. On the right, you can kind of see it's a little bit more passive. He's probably just watching Paw Patrol. That was very popular, continues to be popular now that he's um, six. 
And um, you can just see a different stance here. Um, and that's because in the digital format, um, generally speaking, the experience is pretty well programmed in. Like you're gonna go from this spot, um, this activity to this activity. When you're watching something, it's even more so that way. Um, it's just generally speaking, fewer loose parts, but not impossible to come by for sure. Um, and so when we compare what loose parts look like in digital format versus analog format, um, you can start to appreciate, well, okay, this going back to this example of um, the drawing app, you know, it is very open-ended, but it's not quite as loose as the analog form of um, painting. So if you want to choose a color, for instance, you're pretty much, I think you have about six or seven choices and that's it. Whereas in the analog world, you can mix and match and make different shades of orange or yellow, or, you know, you could, it's kind of infinite, the, um, the variety that you can come up with. So I'm just, here I'm just making the point that loose parts are available in digital format. Um, not always. Um, I'm going to give an example in, on the next slide of how sometimes they're pretty constrained. Um, but even so, compared to the analog world, um, generally speaking, the loose parts aren't quite as loose. And that can constrain children's play in important ways. Okay, so we've got open-ended, self-paced, the presence of loose parts when it comes to um, self-directed. And then the fourth component here is an absence of dark patterns. Um, and so, you know, I'm sure given this audience, you're pretty well familiar with the concept of dark patterns, but basically just any sort of design feature that has been introduced in order to keep a user's engagement without regard to their well-being. And so when you're talking about the context of children and their digital experiences, if they're playing a game, things like having to beat a clock or characters who cry when you leave, exit the, the um, app, or navigation constraints that make it difficult to find your way home and kind of keep you inside. Um, different lures such as reward, candies, and virtual choice. All of these things are there to keep a child playing, to keep a child on a particular platform, um, and to really focus in their um, attention. And so to give you a contrast of, um, again, returning to Oliver, um, these are two apps that he has been very uh, engaged in over the last couple of years. Um, on the left-hand side with the, the drawing app, as I talked about already, it's very open-ended, it's very user-driven. Um, However, on the right-hand side, um, this Paw Patrol rescue run, when Oliver plays that, um, it's just, a, his stance is completely different. So he's, uh, he's on it. The game is really directing him in a one particular way to the end of whatever run he's doing, whatever mission he's doing. His focus and his task is to collect as many rewards. I think they're pup treats um, and badges as he can. And the promise of getting more pup treats and more rewards keeps him playing. Um, when he's playing this game, it's really hard for me to engage in a conversation with him. Um, he tends to play for a lot longer um, duration than he would if he's just building with Lego. Um, and so this really um, comes to the question of when I talk about a self-directed technology experience, I'm really asking where is the agency? is the agency with the child or is it with the app or whatever technology they happen to be using? And how is the design of that technology impacting the locus of agency? Is it with the child or with the app? And so with these two examples, I'm showing how, um, generally speaking, when you design experiences that are more open-ended, user-paced, that allow for different options of movement, um, that, generally speaking, is a more self-directed experience. Okay, so self-directed digital experiences are best for children's development. Um, but then this other piece is just as important, the community-supported part. 
Um, and so that part, if we now take Oliver's um, use of Peppa, Peppa's paint box and think about, okay, what are the community so supports surrounding his technology experience? Um, this is also another dimension that I'm talking about in the book. And so when it comes to early childhood and something like um, engaging with an app on a tablet, um, you know, things like I mentioned when Oliver is playing um, Paw Patrol Rescue Run, it's extremely difficult to hold a conversation with him. And that's because, and actually my colleague Alexis Hineker has done some great research on that to show how his attention is really being co-opted by that app and there's really no room for him to then talk with me. So one indication then of a tech experience that is not so much self-directed is this ability of can a child engage in a conversation outside of that um, app experience or is their attention so co-opted and so focused on that experience that everything else is blocked out. Um, so that is one um, indication and then, you know, being able to join in, of course, there's a lot of research on the value of joint media engagement. Um, and, you know, with something like this app, I am able to ask Oliver what he's doing and to provide him some support um, and really provide a lot of scaffolding. Um, and one piece of this community support that children experience surrounding um, a tech experience is really when uh, it could be a caregiver, it could be a teacher, it could be a sibling, can help make that experience specific to the child. And so in the book, I talk about the importance of social contingency to really make sure that um, the child's experience is being connected to some aspect of their experience, their lives. Because if you think about how children develop and grow, it's in this um, context of caregiver support. And the thing that makes caregiver support so effective is this ability to know the child, to really hone in on their, what their existing skills are, what they're interested in, and then connect it to whatever they're learning. So in this case, if it's something that they're doing with technology. And then um, extend the experience. So maybe um, let's say I'm, I'm a parent and I'm watching my child engage in um, an early literacy um, app. And maybe they're learning about different um, words and letters. When they put that app away, I can extend the experience by pointing out um, words that start with the letter that they've learned, B or C or whatever it is. Um, so there's a lot of community support and a lot of research um, showing, you know, just how important whatever it is, is that's going on around the tech experience and how that is actually supporting um, what's going on there. So self-directed, community supported. Um, and I just wanted to kind of extend this concept of community support beyond early childhood. Um, and into when we started to talk about middle childhood, early adolescence, and um, and onward, you know the the nature of the community support will change, but it's just as important. So if you think about um, you know a child who's eight, nine, or ten playing video games, there's a lot of community support that can go on, joint media engagement, um, or even just showing an interest. I recently gave a talk. Um, at a school in Seattle, and I was talking about this concept of community support and, you know, the importance of joining in and joint media engagement, and afterwards one parent said, but I just really don't like video games. Do I have to learn how to play video games? Do I have to play with my kid? And that's absolutely not, um, but just even showing interest, showing engagement, or just wanting to know about that is a form of community support. Um, you know, when you think about kids and when they um, get their first phone, you know, 11, 12, 13, whenever that is, um, what sort of community support is around there? Are there training wheels that parents put on to um, support uh, their child and getting them ready for the challenges of managing phone use and all of the social media that comes with it? Um, and then 
when it comes to older teens and engaging with social media, there's a ton of community support that goes on around that. Um, and in the book, I talk about not just the community support that is surrounding that comes from parents and peers, but also when, when young people are engaged in social media platforms, thinking about the community support that is actually taking place within that platform is really important as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Okay, so my argument is that you can actually get pretty far by asking these two questions um, when you're trying to figure out if a tech experience is supporting a child's development or perhaps undermining development. Is it self-directed? Is it community supported? And so in the book, I really bring that framework to bear on different um, stages of child development. And I'm looking at what are the key developmental tasks of different stages? So in the early years, I'm looking at the importance of developing executive function, self-regulation skills. I look at early literacy. As we move into early middle childhood, I'm looking at play and learning. And then in the tween years, um, the changing family relationships, friendships, of course, that becomes increasingly important. Um, questions of identity and then into emerging adulthood civic engagement. So at each of these kind of inflection points with where development is going and at each stage of development, I'm really um, gathering together the research of when is a technology experience supportive of these developmental tasks and when is it not um, looking through this framework of is it self-directed and community supported. Okay, so the second part, I talk also about a bunch of factors. What is it that actually creates a self-directed and community supported digital experience? Um, and I, of course, talk about individual children, um, arguing how important it is to focus um, on the individual child and you know, what they bring to a particular experience, their surrounding context, um, you know, bringing to bear my, my view of development as an individual interacting with their um, cultural community. Um, and then also I talk a lot about the design of technology and how the design um, really impacts the experience. And so that's what I want to focus in on here is really the tech design. Um, and I want to um, introduce how I've been thinking about this, um, drawing on a lot of great research, some by you in this audience here, um, to think about how is it that the design of particular features then bubbles up into like this other experience that's going to impact a child's development. So I, I'm really trying to bring an understanding of child development and technology design together to provide insight. Um, so I talk about three layers of technology to think about that connection between the actual design of a technology and then a child's experience of it. So the first layer, I'm talking about the feature layer. I think about this as like those individual design choices, the de decision to put a, um, a, a, a like feature, de the decision to show how, a like count, hashtags, things like that. So the actual individual interaction designs is the feature layer. And on different platforms, you're gonna have different features. On social media, you have a lot of similar features, but then each platform has you know, their own different ones. Um, and those features are then going to impact what happens at the practice layer. And so here I talk about um, the affordances. And so I draw on um, literature related to um, affordances. So let's take the hashtag, for instance. The, uh, the use of a hashtag facilitates the affordance of durability or visibility um, or even searchability. So these are kinds of affordances or possibilities of action that are made possible by individual design decisions. And so things like visibility, um, anonymity, um, these different um, things that certain things are possible, certain things are not possible. That's really what I'm talking about at the practice layer. It's really when the human 
comes in contact with the features and then what happens or what could happen. And then at the top, I talk about the culture layer. And so you've got all this practice going on um, that is influenced both by the people who are there on the platform and the features and that have been um, introduced onto this platform. And you got things going on, practices, and then eventually that kind of bubbles up into creating a distinct culture or set of cultures. And so I find that these three layers are a helpful way of thinking about what's going on on any particular platform. And I'm gonna give you an example, um, a comparative example. I'm gonna compare Tumblr, Instagram, and Be Real, just to think about how those features um, interact and give rise to quite distinct cultures. Um, so with Tumblr, um, Tumblr is actually, it seems to be having a moment now <laughs> in the last few months since um, Twitter has kind of uh, gone down the drain. But um, Tumblr is very much, it's a social media site, just like um, Instagram, but it's actually very different. Um, instead of being kind of really centered on a person's profile, it's more the person's blog. So I have a profile on um, Tumblr, but the profile is not really the point. It's what I post on there. Um, it's it's typically pseudonymous. So the kinds of names that you have, it's, I don't know, things like I'm a goat or the what one I was looking at the other day was Master of Denmark. You know, they're, they're these names that are not associated with your government issued ID. Um, so it's much more playful in that way. Um, really the currency I would say of interacting on Tumblr, there are many, but one key one is the ability to reblog, um, reblog somebody's post and to add your commentary through hashtags or um, whatever you want. It's also very multimedia. So um, whereas Instagram is very focused, you know, I would say their currency is very visual, very image-based video, more with reels now. With Tumblr, you've got lots of memes, you've got GIFs, you've got lots of things going on um, and lots of different kinds of media encouraged. Um, so contrast that with Instagram, as I've sort of already alluded to, it's very much profile based. It kind of started off as like a filter app, you know, basically a way to filter your pictures. And so that emphasis on performance and um, perfection and beauty um, has really been there right from the beginning. Um, likes, obviously, very important. And as I mentioned, images and videos. Um, and so as a result you of these individual um, features, you've actually got different things going on, different kinds of practices going on these two different platforms. And if you've spent any time on both of these um, uh, platforms, as I'm sure some of you have, if not most of you, um, there are very different cultures. I wouldn't say there's, of course, there's not one culture on Tumblr, there's not one culture on Instagram, but generally speaking, the kinds of cultures that have um, evolved on Tumblr, um, they're very focused on fandom, they're focused on a social justice sensibility. I talk about my sibling um, in my chapter on identity development and adolescence and how my sibling um, looked to Tumblr in their teen years to develop their sexual identity and their gender identity, um, and really how Facebook and Instagram were not options. Um, it was really Tumblr that made them feel comfortable enough to explore. It was it felt more anonymous. It felt more playful. There were people there who were asking similar questions, um, and it was a very different culture than on Instagram. Um, and then I'm, I also decided to add in Be Real. I don't talk about Be Real in the book, but I'm currently doing some research with um, Alexis Hineker and um, some of uh, her students on Be Real, where we, we've been interviewing teens about their, you know, what brought them to Be Real, how do they think about it compared to Tumblr and Instagram. And that, again, it's very different. And I'm not sure how long Be Real is going to last, quite honestly. Um, and it might be just because of the way it's designed. So um, with Be Real, there are no filters. So, you know, the whole idea is to be real. It's really trying to emphasize authenticity. You can only post once per day and you can only see other people's posts. Um, 
after you have posted yourself, you have, I think, a two minute um, timer from the moment you get a notification. And that's the other thing, you don't get to decide when you post, you're told when to post. There's a way to game um, that system, but generally speaking, that's what it is. Um, it's ephemeral, so your post goes away after a day. Um, there's not really as much emphasis on accumulating friends. So once you get to 50 friends, it just shows 50 plus friends. So it really doesn't matter if you have 50 or 100 or 1,000. Most teens that we're talking to have like 20 to 50 or so friends. Um, so really, you know, these individual level feature layer um, decisions are, are um, changing and, and, and sculpting, um, shaping how teens interact with Be Real. And it's quite different from the way they're interacting with Instagram or with Tumblr. Um, and so far, at least, you know, they haven't, it's only been in existence for a couple of years. And the teens we're speaking to have only been using it for, you know, a year or less. Um, they feel like there is more emphasis on authenticity um, to a degree. There are definitely um, some teens who are talking about, well, you know, it's still social media in the end. Um, but these features really do make a difference. Um, so hopefully that gives you an, um, like a view of how these, the feature practice and culture layer all kind of come together. Um, but of course, I wanna to return to the individual and the context really briefly, uh, mindful of the time um, to say that yes, the tech design absolutely matters, but we have to keep in mind the individual child and the context. So for instance, you could have two teens um, who are looking at the exact same content on Instagram, and one has a vulnerability towards depression and anxiety, and the other one doesn't, and they interpret what they're seeing completely differently. So same features, same um, practice abilities, same culture, but the individual is having a different response. You could have those same two teens, um, well, actually you could have two teens, let's say, who are both looking at the same content, they both um, have a vulnerability to depression, anxiety, but one of them has a really strong peer support network and maybe one or more important adults in their lives who are helping to um, frame what they're seeing, maybe working with them to develop strategies to block certain content, follow different content. So the context surrounding their technology use is really making a difference. So again, I don't wanna, by focusing on the tech design, I don't wanna um, lose sight of how important the individual child and the context is um, to this story. So finally, the last part, um, part three, a call to action. Um, how can use positive digital experiences be supported? Um, so in the book, I talk about a lot of different um, people and, and groups of people who need to be involved. A, a lot of um, focus has been, so far I would say, on the individual level, the family level, and the schools. Um, you know, trying to give teens or you know kids, families, um, the tools to manage their technology use. Uh, I really emphasize in the book that we need that bottom level as well, policy, industry, and research to really get involved um, because I, I don't think it's realistic to leave it to individual people. Um, but what I'm going to focus on in my last few minutes is returning to my two roles, the two hats that I have on when I'm writing this book. Um, I'm a parent and a researcher, so I'm going to talk about um, the call to action and actually call myself to action. This is, these are the actions that I have been inspired um, for me after writing this book. Um, so as a researcher these days, I'm really interested in what we can do at the feature layer to make um, social media better for teens. So that's where I've been spending a lot of my time. I'm gonna quickly show you um, an example of what I've been uh, working on. Um, my colleagues and I have developed an app called Locus um, to see if we can tinker with um, these individual interactions to actually make social media a better experience. And um, these are my partners in crime. Um, I work most closely with Peter Slovak um, in this work. And we're trying to think about, can we intervene in the moment to support young people's intentional social media use? 
Um, so here's just a screenshot, my screenshot of my phone actually with Locus on it. I'm just gonna show you quickly how it works. Basically, this is a wrapper application that um, control so that we use it so that we can control how a teen enters into a social media um, platform. So they might decide that they want to enter into TikTok. And before they get, uh, they click on TikTok before going to TikTok, because they've entered through our wrapper application, they get prompted once a day to reflect on their goal. Um, and they, the, the idea is to set a goal for their social media use. Um, they may open Twitter. What would make you feel good about your time on Twitter today? They can enter, type in their response, they can voice record it, or they could just dismiss it um, and go on. YouTube, similarly, what are you planning to do after using YouTube? So all of the questions are something around self-regulation, whether goal setting, reflection, um, uh, and it's things like that. Um, we also have a universal general prompt at the end of the day for them to either reflect on how they've used social media that day or how they're planning to use it um, in the following day. And we've actually, we did uh, have done a few field deployments of this, just open field trials, but we have shown, we've, we've seen some promising results where teens um, are becoming more intentional in their social media use. And so really this is, this is not put forth as an intervention, um, like a standalone intervention, more as a proof of concept to show, hey, you know what, if we tinker at the way these features that shape someone's experience of social media, that can actually have an impact on their experience and hopefully downstream their well-being. Um, so here are the key features, really ba very basic wrapper application, app entry prompts, end of day prompt. Um, and that's basically what it is. Um, the second thing that I'm spending a lot of my time um, focused on these days is thinking about, can we detect when things are going well and not so well for teens when um, they're using social media with the eye towards um, developing well-being metrics? So things like um, in the moment, can we uh, know if something's going well or not? Because if we can know that, then that can actually have some implications with how we design these platforms or how the like the kinds of government policies we recommend for supporting. Uh, but we're not going to know like what we're going to, the designs we should do, the government regulations we should put in place until we actually know when things are working and when they're not in a pretty precise way. So that's what we're trying to figure out um, in my lab as well. And then finally, as I wrap up, as a parent, um, this is something that I talk about in the book is the concept of a good enough digital parent. And it actually comes from a mid uh, 20th century um, pediatrician, Donald Winnicott, who wrote about the good enough mother, um, but I updated it for good enough parent. And um, the whole idea is that um, Winnicott was arguing that in order to support children's development, um, and really to build their resiliency, parents actually, their job is not to be there 100% all the time for their kids. They actually need to let their kids fail a little bit. They need to let them figure out how to be bored and get themselves unbored. And so I use that idea and I apply it to the digital realm to think about parents, not as you know these omniscient beings who know exactly how to guide their children in the best technology experiences, but more as, you know, we're kind of learning alongside our children, we're making mistakes, we're observing very carefully, and then we're changing course as needed. So as a parent, I've come to um, embrace this idea of being a good enough digital parent. And as much as I can, um, I think about is this particular experience for, for Oliver, is it self-directed? Is it community supported? If I feel that it's not, then I really, like, I really actually am doing this. I'm, I'm pivoting and changing um, what I expose him to. So in summary, I've presented you a framework, self-directed, community supported. Um, I talked about some factors focusing in on tech design and how it has a really important impact on a child's experience with technology. And then a call to action, particularly at the re as the as a researcher, and then also a parent embracing the good enough digital parent um, idea. 
And I'll end there with like maybe three minutes to spare. <laughs> Thank you. And I just want to say that um, you can't get a good Oh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Sorry about the delay of getting started. Sounds like you were saying that commercial experience is a bad yeah absolutely and, yeah and i think i i think that's a point well taken um the i'm not I'm not necessarily saying that immersion is is necessarily a bad thing, um, but who's in control during that emo immersion? So in a flow experience, you know, you're very much you're like right in that sweet spot of it's just challenging enough, and that's because you know you're in control, and maybe you're just you're so in control that you have blinkers on. I think that's you know, that's an example that it fits very well with being self-directed. And maybe, yes, you're not able to have a conversation on the side when you're really in that flow experience. Um, but um, so I, I don't think it's like being able to hold a conversation is a necessary component. It's just one indication. I would say that playing Paw Patrol Rescue Run is not really a flow experience, more as a hijacking of attention, which I like, Oliver still sometimes plays it. So it's it's not like I'm saying don't ever do this. It's just be on the lookout a little bit. Yeah. Going off that space about context. And I think also a really great character of the piece being used in the moment by the children and teenagers. Because I think it's sort of a great example of conversion. Um, so it's also like what is the context regarding the attitude you would use by the child or the yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the context is huge. I didn't go into it as much in this talk, but it, I do a lot in the book. Yeah, very. Can you connect your, your framework to other frameworks like the frameworks or other ways of thinking learning and technology? Yeah, I mean, I think um, with connected learning, um, really that community supported aspect is really key. I talk about connected learning in the chapter on learning. Um, and I think the two go really well because connected learning, it's, you know, at the center is a learner's interest and um, kind of what makes them tick. And I think that's really key to self-direction and agency. Um, but then the, yeah, actually it fits really well because with connected learning, um, it's that learner and it's their agency but it's everything surrounding it that enables it and then connects to other experiences. So I think they work very well together. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>
Uh, I, I'll ask them to send you. Oh, I see. Okay. 